Hi, my name is Lowell Francis, and I am the manager for the Gauntlet Gaming Community. We're getting uh, Jamila back in here in just a moment uh, to, so that we can have their camera on, uh, and then we'll uh, 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 try to get them set in here. They have a, a few technical issues. Uh, while that, that we're getting Jamila in, uh, I'll say, so I am the manager, there we go, uh, for the Gauntlet Gaming Community, which is an online community uh, uh, operating uh, for about five, six years now. Uh, I took over as the manager for the community uh, back in uh, uh, August, uh, I believe, 2019. And before that, for a couple of years, I've been the, the player GM manager for that. Um, Jamie, it looks like the camera is not going to be listening to you. Oh really? I can see myself. How strange! It is. It is strange. Um, maybe it may be like the thing does that based on bandwidth. Maybe you'll pop back in when sure, it decides sure. that you're you're good. Uh, so Jamila is here. Uh, uh, Jamie, do you want to talk about your your background, or shall I introduce you? Oh yeah, sure. I, I'd I'd love to uh introduce myself <laughs> so hi my name is jammy i'm so sorry my camera's not working right now but uh, i joined the gauntlet fairly recently in october 2019 i was invited to facilitate to be a gm at one of the uh, online conventions uh the gauntlet community is famous for their online conventions and i had such a good time it was such a great experience that i had to join the gauntlet thereafter and uh yeah and i'm also one of the co-hosts of the podcast with lowell it's really great fun um last year i ran i ran almost 200 or i was in i think a combination of both i want to say actually it was a really ridiculous number uh but i think around 200 games last year i'm slowing down this year but um but that's just how much fun i have on the gauntlet <laughs> uh and in terms of game design and play uh, I'm I'm one of the designers writers of Hearts of Ulin, uh, and then uh, uh, Jamila is the designer of Balak Bayan, as well as a host of other games that you can find on their Patreon and their itch.io page. Uh, and they're working on a couple of projects with Evil Hat, and they've also done. I just I just want to throw this out there because they won't uh, uh, stretch <laughs> goals for a bunch of different games. Uh, so that that's who we are. Uh, I'm going to kind of set things up and then Jamie will have a, a converse uh, and I will have a conversation about some things and hopefully we can answer some questions. Uh, basically, I want to talk about some of the things that we've learned as an online community and bringing a community together online. I know a lot of you have experience with that, but I want to talk about some of the lessons and hopefully some things maybe other people can, can take away from that. Uh, so to give you the basics, uh, the Gauntlet Gaming Community is a group of online tabletop facilitators, players, and enthusiasts. We have a dedicated calendar app that allows GMs to schedule games and players to sign up for them with a wait list and notifications and all that. We have right now about 120 sessions every month, and that's mostly indie and story games, a lot of PBTA, uh, some OSR, that kind of thing. It's all volunteer game facilitators. All of that is supported by a Patreon. Uh, Patreon members can uh, get early sign up for sessions, um, but we also have a program to allow that early access for marginalized gamers and those suffering financial hardship. Uh, and then as Jamie mentioned, we also have a community podcast that fits with that. We've got a YouTube page for facilitators who have recorded their sessions forums, uh, our webpage blog. We've got a community Slack that's just dedicated to talking about the games. Uh, and if you know Garrett Reinhouse, uh, we also have a large collection of free online gaming tools. Um, you may know the gauntlet from our separate publishing division uh, that handles the monthly zine codex, as well as Brindlewood Bay, Trophy, and Hearts of Wulin. Uh, and so I, I want to, again, talk about some things in the community and answer, answer some, some questions. Um, Jamie, um, where do you think we should start? 
Yeah, I think I'd love to talk about like one of the things that we're most famous for, uh, and I think a lot of people appreciate, including myself when I first joined, is our culture of safety. I think it's been at the core of a lot of what we do, like helping people feel safe in the community. And I didn't, personally, I didn't realize until I joined the until I joined the gauntlet, like what that was supposed to look like. I feel, and and we've taken a very very specific structural step that we ask our GMs to follow a, a starting template. Uh, we have online tools for that, so we ask for a layered set of of expectations, usually lines and veils, uh, X card and open door policy. But GMs can use other tools. Uh, we make that a base expectation for everyone, and we work through GMs to show them how they communicate that and how that gets brought to the table. Um, and then we also have a code of conduct that that supplements that. Um, and so we really kind of set the lines. We've also had a, an evolving conversation about what safety tools work, how we present them, and so on in the community that I think every few months uh, we revisit that and look at what what works for us. Um, for example, uh, I think it was last year that we said, okay, how are we handling recording permissions and started getting a new template uh, uh, for, for how we do, do that. Um, uh, but I'll throw it back to you, Jamie. Yeah, and I think so safety tools is a conversation that comes up often in the TTRPG space. And I feel that what we try to do at the gauntlet is to, the way that we use safety tools, and I feel like anyone can, but I feel I've seen it implemented really well in the gauntlet, is that safety tools are communication tools that set expectations and boundaries. We often see people say, oh, I use safety tools, but things still went wrong. So that must mean there's something wrong with the safety tool. When on the gauntlet, we know that safety tools don't guarantee moments of unsafety won't happen. They minimize the chances, but they help frame a productive discussion in case something happens despite our best intentions. And I feel that in the gauntlet, we use them very simply, very clearly. And I saw them I see them used again and again as a way to just check in with each other, as a way to like just keep the lines of conversation open. And I feel I feel it's really made a strong difference in being able to really care for each other while having a really good time, while focusing on having a good time and a good story. And I think really for a community, it's been about establishing a baseline. Not all tools work for all GMs, but we try to provide access and, and and expectation of that. And that that's been good. And I know a lot of online communities have been doing that for years. It's it's something that I think that we've seen in more and more of what we might call the trad communities here in the United States and so on is an evolving uh, set of things. Um, uh, so one of the things that people sometimes talk about with the gauntlet is the idea of the, the gauntlet play culture. Uh, which is another thing sort of related to safety tools that we've uh, established. Um, we have a dedicated Slack and uh, our GMs are talking about what play culture means. Um, and uh, we don't have necessarily one a particular approach, uh, but we have some things that are sort of shared values that we continually reinforce in our documentation we continually reinforce and communicate to our GMs and, and so on, uh, uh, in particular, the idea of, of constantly checking in. Certainly, that's something that comes from, from LARP communities uh, and that we've tried to, to uh, focus on for the online production. Um, Jamie? Yeah, and I think it's a, we have through the Slack and through our forums, but uh, I'm very active on the Slack. So we have a channel dedicated to GM support and there's also one for player support. And I've noticed that with GMs, if someone hasn't, uh, if someone needs advice on how to run a particular game or if they're having problems at the table or if they want to try a new crazy idea and they're not sure how to pull it off, the gauntlet is there to 
help you talk through things and uh, explore other ideas. And I think one of the things that the Gauntlet offers is seeing so many different play styles, seeing so many different facilitation styles. Even though I have been running for like a long time, I feel like I, I learn something new from the Gauntlet like every month from one of my GMs. So uh, it's been it's been really cool. Oh, we have a question. So if there is if drama happens like in the middle of a of a game, and how do we handle it? Uh, actually, I think I had a personal experience where I was still fairly new to the gauntlet. I was playing a game. I was very attached to this NPC. I wanted good things for this NPC, but the NPC was kind of a bad guy, kind of not a bad guy. Anyway, so I was I was trying to help them, and one of the other players as a move just killed the NPC. And so it was it was really shocking for me. And so even though I had the safety tools on hand, I and I still struggle with this, right? I'm not very good in the moment to use them, but the other players immediately noticed something was was off. And so the player who who did that stopped the game to like check in with me and asked, okay, so uh, is everything okay? Should we rewind and change that. And I think the fact that people on the gauntlet are sensitive to other people and just quickly check in. And I notice that even if something difficult happens, people treat it as very matter of factly uh, and really just very kindly, right? Like they, they don't make it a big deal if you want to change something, if you're uncomfortable with something, there's no need for you to apologize. And by, it made me braver as a player to just say, oh, I'm not really okay if something like this happens. I didn't realize that over the years I just put up with things even if I'm uncomfortable for the sake of the group. So I really appreciate it. It's true, uh, the Godlet people are very considerate, but, uh, but you know, I also feel like by bringing that into other communities, we spread that consideration and kindness. And I'll say, I really think this is a case where building that play culture being explicit that we're going to use safety tools right at the start and encouraging GMs to do that check-in, that having that builds a safety net, uh, that uh, people begin to realize. Because we've had players that have come in and joined the gauntlet, and clearly it's not the same play, play culture as they're used to. But we we stop and we help them work through that. Um, and and we learn uh, how, to, how to fix it. You know, the our GMs know, you know, if there's an issue to stop the game, to, to check in uh, on things uh, uh, and to to make sure that people are on the the same page. And and like, for example, playing Last Fleet a couple weeks ago and session got really tense and a little maybe a little more fascist than I wanted with all the military stuff. And, and I stepped away for a couple of minutes to kind of figure out how I wanted to continue to approach the game. I didn't want to stop the game, but I wanted to step away to, to think about that. And I said in the chat, I'm going to step away for a couple of minutes. G GM knows that that's a thing. And the GM checked in with me when I got back. Um, and that's, that's a GM who has some experience with that. And, and, by building those set of expectations over time, we've made it so that when there is drama, we know that we can stop, we can check in, uh, we can do that. You know, sometimes sometimes it doesn't work. You know, there are a, a few times, but I would say uh, the vast majority of the times, because we've already built up the expectation of those tools, it does does follow through. Yeah, that's very true. Um, let me talk about a structural thing that we do. Maybe I'm going to get to some, maybe some more concrete things that you might consider for your online communities, some online tools that you might bring that to, to the table. Uh, we do uh, what's called open table, which means that uh, when a GM posts their sessions, and usually most GMs will post like four or five sessions. It's a series uh, within a span of a month. Uh, or they'll post like a three month series, which, you know, will be 12 to 13 sessions. Um, these, these are tight games. Usually with the PBTA game, you can get a good story in, in those four to five sessions. Maybe you need longer time. But one of the things 
is is that the GMs know that anybody can sign up and anybody can sign up for any number of those sessions. So they might not be there for all the time. Um, and that's what's called open table. And of course, if people have to miss a session, there might be new people that pop in. That is a challenging thing for the GM. It means that they have to be ready to accommodate drop-ins and have to be thinking about that, uh, that there might be guest stars and things. Uh, and that's something that's been very important uh, to us. Uh, we don't ask players to know the game before they come in. The GMs know that as a base expectation that they're going to have to explain things to the players. Uh, and I think that's been really good. It means that anybody can look at an event and feel like they're welcome to come in and join that event. Um, and it's something I had to get used to as a GM because I'm so used to, okay, we're going to have X players playing for, you know, all of the sessions. Uh, but I think that's been really interesting and we've gotten uh, more players involved as a result of that. And I think it's made our play stronger. I don't know what your thoughts on that are, Jamie. Oh yeah, absolutely. I feel that just the fact that you called it a guest star, right? I think is a very gauntlet thing. The idea that someone who comes in just for that one or uh, two sessions gets to be the guest star. And I think it's important because we also have our open door policy, right? So if for whatever reason, someone can't make it to the game, so just recently, I'm running a, an, an ongoing campaign and on the gauntlet, and one of my players couldn't make it. So that meant someone from the wait list got bumped up. And the gauntlet has really taught me how to just be very flexible with bringing in a new player. And because there's that expectation, the new player can come in. And the other players who know what's going on or who've helped establish that story beforehand can help also. So it's very collaborative. It, it goes really well. Uh, the last time this happened last week, the game went really swimmingly and it's a new skill that I'm learning all the time as a, as being part of the gauntlet. And I wish, yeah, I wish I had known about the open table stuff beforehand. Like it's not something I'm used to because I'm so used as a GM, like, oh, one person can't make it. So we're canceling the game <laughs> like, or something similar, right? So it's it's a lot of fun this this flexibility and i really do think it's a skill set that as a gm you develop it's yeah. a challenge it's mm -hmm. a, a way of building it up and players will work hard to 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 onboard new players one of the things as a gm is it means is i'm thinking about what is the minimum set of setting information that i need to give to the player set up that won't overwhelm them and i think that that's that's really good um because Sometimes as a GM, you've got all these things you want to tell the players, uh, and that can be overwhelming. You learn how to cut that down to the most important things they need to make a decision about what their character is going to be and decisions about where they are at the start. Uh, and I think that's, that's really important. Um, one of the other things that we do that I think is, is really good in our online community is we have something called a GM facilitator camp. And this is a program that we have maybe every six months. And we have uh, experienced GMs set up uh, a camp and they will bring in uh, th like three GMs who want to run with us, uh, who have been on the gauntlet as players, who want to run with us and uh, they will do a workshop session where they just talk about GMing, what the processes are, what our, our requirements are, all of that. And they answer questions, talk about what they've learned about running online. And then they do three sessions, each one with one of those new GMs running a session for everyone else. And then they take about a half hour or so, maybe more depending on who's running it, uh, to do a debrief at the end to talk about what did they do? How could they improve things? What questions do they have? Um, it's not a requirement that new GMs go through this, but we found that it is a hugely useful tool uh, that, that GMs who have gone through this process really enjoy it. Uh, they feel supported uh, and it, it really helps. Now, Jamie, you've run 
uh, one of these camps. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I ran Camp Ochre Jelly, one of uh, four camps that went on, I think, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, and so it was a lot of fun. We had three other GMs. And so the first, it's usually four sessions in a month. And the first one is the facilitator just going over all the technical know-how, the platforms, the uh, how to set up a game, all the technical details. But what people really get excited for, I mean, that stuff is important, but what people get excited for is helping with GMing techniques. And so we had a really interesting batch last time where we had someone who only started GMing this year. We had someone who's been GMing for a few years. We had another person who was GMing for more than a decade. But I still felt like we all learned from each other. It was it was a really, really great experience. We got three different games we got to play. I'm trying to remember. We played Night Witches. We played Ashen. I'm trying to remember the gumshoe space game, Ashen Stars. Ashen Stars. Yeah, Ashen Stars. And then Monster of the Week. So that was super fun. And so after each one shot, we get to break down what happened during the game. And it's a good opportunity for GMs to ask questions. And so for some of them, it's about how to run better online. For others, it's how do I hard frame or how do I focus on certain aspects of the story? So we have a question, how do you choose the games to play during the camp? We actually leave it up to the campers. So when they sign up, we tell them in advance, you're going to run a one shot. So we recommend, I mean, if you want to be brave <laughs> and run a new game, you can absolutely do that. But we recommend running a game that you're familiar with, even if it's a GM less game, even if it's uh, that kind of game. What's important is that you get used to facilitating online uh, at the camp. So it's been, it was a lot of fun. I think the the trouble was trying to not spend too much time because everybody loves talking afterwards and geeking out about RPGs and geeking about uh, GMing techniques. It was a lot of fun. And I'm still very close to all my campers and they're all running games on the gauntlet. So, which is super fun. It, it means that you get a, a kind of a mentor relationship. It means that, that GMs have somebody that they can go and talk to about questions. Uh, and we get, you know, a lot of discussion about things like, how do you structure an online session? If we're doing three hours, how do we, how do we structure that? Uh, where, when do we take breaks? These are things that, that are different in an online environment. Um, we talk about how to handle uh, uh, questions of safety at the table, you know, how to bring people in, how to, how to uh, do arcs and uh, how to build character keepers. Uh, all of these things are, are techniques that, that we have. We're looking at uh, doing the same sort of thing, uh, but with a game designer camp, maybe this year. Um, uh, uh, so uh, that's that's something that we're looking at with the same sort of structure. Someone who's done some game design, and then bringing in some people who've done who are interested in doing some hacks or new designs or things uh, like that. Um, uh, so a question in in the the question is what is a character? Yeah, I was about to ask. <laughs> um, let me grab actually one of them and I can screen share and show you something. Ooh, that, uh, that's yeah. right. Uh, so with online play, I know people are using Roll20 and other tools. Roll20 is great. And it has some beautiful character sheets in there and, 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 and all of that kind of thing. There's a lot of uh, overhead for Roll20 with the maps and things like that. So generally, a lot of our games, which are very much theater of the mind, are just about, okay, we need a character sheet and we need a conversation. We don't need maps and things like that. Uh, so we build uh, character keepers uh, and a lot of the time through uh, a Google sheet. So I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna share my screen here. Da, 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 da. Uh, so uh, uh, on my screen, you'll see um, once uh, uh, it get used to, I don't know if it's blinking for you or, or not. Oh yeah, uh, it is blinking. Okay, yeah. I don't know why it is doing that, uh, but uh, we have you a. You want me to sh try sharing mine? I have yeah, one also. Yeah, let's see if. Uh, in if, case uh, it, since my camera's not working, <laughs> I can okay. at least get that. <laughs> I can at least get that to work. Uh, so these let me are, try to do that. Yeah, are, these are generally done through Google Sheets. They are a spreadsheet 
we usually have one page that has the characters on it. We have one page that uh, breaks down uh, the, uh, so as you can see here, this is a page that has all the characters. Um, uh, it has the, the stats and things like that uh, on it. Uh, so we've got all of those notes down at the bottom. We've got the, the details for moves and things. Um, if you look down at the bottom of the tabs here, you can see that um, if you go and hit your safety and dice room, Jamie, right. or well, yeah, that, that's good. Okay. Um, we have one page that's dedicated to our lines and veils uh, that focuses on safety. So we have a shared place where we have a list uh, of the things that we line, hard line on, we don't want to see, veil, we want to fade to black if we get to it, and then ask first. Um, and we do that for almost all of our, our sheets uh, so that there's a constant reference and it's also something that can get updated as we go along. Uh, so then we saw the characters tab, why don't you hit the masks or, or, or uh, NPCs tab. So here's one of my favorite parts <laughs> is uh, we have usually a tab that has the NPCs pictures and some notes uh, that is a shared thing for the players. As you can see, this is a game. We've only done a couple of sessions of it already. Uh, 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 Jamila's got uh, uh, far too many NPCs. Um, <laughs> oh, but they're all, and, and, all and handsome defense, and hot. This is the online campaign. So like, this is the one that's been going on for a few months in my defense. Um, why don't you show us the player reference then? Sure. I like putting this together so people have something to look at. So usually what we'll have, this works especially well for PBTA, is we'll have a, a reference page that talks about what kind of actions there are, uh, what kind of moves there are, uh, the basics of that. I want to say uh, that if you want to figure out a game, if you want to learn how to a new game, one of the best ways to do that is to sit down and build a character keeper mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because you'll figure out what the most important things are that you want to convey, how the sheet is set up and, and uh, all of that. And I think we've lost your camera again there, Jamie. Oh, we did? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, but is my but screen still working. <laughs> I'm seeing I've seen a little little icon for you, but but not the okay. screen share. So you can stop screen sharing. Okay, sure, sure, sure. Got it, got it. Um, but the, the, those are things that we built. Now, we have on the gauntlet a free uh, uh, space where we have tons of character keepers, uh, a couple hundred different ones that people have already built. So one of the things is, is now we've got that created uh, it's a, a base set of tools that people then can can uh, use to recreate uh, things or modify them. For example, if somebody has a fate sheet like for Fate of Cthulhu, uh, in a couple months I'm running another fate game, I'm going to take that and rework that because they've already done a lot of the labor for that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, building up a shared collection of resources for the community is is really important and has been very useful. And that is out there for anyone on the internet to, to have access to. Um, uh, yeah, and, we have hundreds of character keepers yeah. available, right? Uh, so hopefully we'll uh, uh, put a link to that. Um, we also just at our uh, gauntlet uh, uh, online convention we did last week, uh, we had uh, a seminar done on how to build character keepers. Uh, and uh, I will try and send the, that, that link uh, to the to organizers so that they can, you can have that in the, the, the sheet as well. Um, uh, let me see what else of sort of gauntlet -y stuff is. Uh, oh, would we like to talk about uh, a culture that supports game creators about that's been happening. It's I, I've taken advantage of that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, talk about how, how you've used that. Yeah. So, when I first came on the gauntlet, people were really excited to play Blake Bayan uh, Returning Home, one of the games I'm working on. It's a cyberpunk supernatural game of machine magic that focuses on Filipino folklore. And people were so excited to, to play the game. And ever since then, I'm, I really fell in love with offering games. So we're very clear when we do it. We say this game is a play test. This game is still in development. We label it very clearly in the subject and in the description. So people know that when they're signing up for a game, it's still a work in progress. And because 
folks on the Godla tend to play so many games, I find that as a game creator, I get really good feedback from people who play a lot of different games from a lot of different backgrounds. And so I have play tested almost all of my games. Um, okay, maybe not all of them. I have about 40 games, but <laughs> like a, a huge chunk. And uh, my biggest project right now, Apocalypse Keys, uh, a full PBTA game, I only was able to get it to such a good state of playability because of the Godlet community, because I was able to play test it uh, across different groups and other folks also run the game and offer to play test it too. So that's super helpful. So generally on the gauntlet, we love helping people play test new games. We love providing essential feedback. And so that's what Lowell mentioned where we're thinking about setting up camps to also help people jump on uh, because we love indie games so much on the gauntlet. We wanna help everybody uh, make their own games too. So that would be super, super cool. <laughs> and I want to even take it outside of the whole realm of play testing. Mm -hmm. One of the things we've encouraged people to do is show us your hacks. If you oh, got yeah. a quick hack for a game, things like that, put it together, tell people this is a hack, and people are willing to try it out. Not necessarily play testing. My game Hearts of Wulin started as that. I just wanted to play a PBTA Wuxia oh, Rome Hats game. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. What was it a hack of? It's just a hack. I just put together a bunch of PBTA stuff that I liked. Oh my gosh, amazing. And it wasn't with intended for publication or anything like that, but we people played it and enjoyed it. I've hacked a bunch of other things. Uh, Changing the Lost PBTA, I've done that. Uh, right now I'm running Knights Black Agents from Pelgrane. Uh, and I've changed some of the resolution system on it to make it. Oh, and Star Trek Express. Let's Star Trek it. Express. I've done Star Trek Adventures and I've done that. Small changes to make it kind of fit and are people willing to try it out. Some of the hacks don't work. I will admit <laughs> that. Uh, I did a hack of 7th C that mm, wasn't so great. Like I, I did not dig it at the end of the day, but people were willing to, to give it a shot and give feedback on that. And I've played in a lot of people hacking other games. Uh, and I think that's one of the best things that if you can build a, an online community that people can get willing to try it out. Um, uh, you don't want everything to uh, be that way. You, you want to have some standard games, but you want to give a space um, for people to do to, to do that. And, and that's been that's been really, really successful for us. I think it's it's a thing yeah. that we've seen a lot of games come out of that. Yeah, we have a, a really popular one is a final girl hack, except instead of the final girl, you are Batman villains who are running away from Batman. So that one's really popular. Uh, but yeah, and also the changeling hack, everybody loves the change. I love the changeling hack uh, that Lowell and Sherry have been working on. It's very, very good. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a it's a hot mess. Um, <laughs> it's a uh, beautiful of a, of a mess. Hack, but it but it's fun. Um, if if you watched uh, Rich Rogers did a seminar yesterday for the con uh, on what's called Star Wars Saturdays, what he has done is over the last couple of years, uh, he has run Saturday morning games, uh, and uh, each one is a hack of an existing game to put it in a Star Wars universe. So we've played Apocalypse World set on Tatooine. Uh, we've played Jason Morningstar's game, uh, The Skeletons, which is about skeletons in a tomb waking up every few hundred years to fight off invaders. Uh, we did that in, as droids in an abandoned Jabba the Hutt's fortress. Uh, Rich has run uh, the game Cartel uh, yeah, I was about with, to with say. Huts. <laughs> um, th there's a lot of, of those things. That's That's been really, really, really good. Um, uh, we had... Oh, there's also Bounty of the Week, which yeah. is a hack of Monster of the Week for Bounty Hunters in Star Wars. Um, and we've had some players do a shared, shared universes. Um, we had a long-running thing called Gauntlet Comics, which a bunch of GMs put together a sort of comics universe and people ran lots of different games in that from basic masks 
to a medical drama of surgeons in a world where there's super beings and and things uh so that's yeah. been, been really su successful for us yeah really really and we have a new one uh that just started this year i believe mm -hmm. the urban fantasy one empire city that's uh an urban fantasy supernatural world set in new york so anyone is encouraged to run any system any game within that shared universe. And we have our own wiki pages so people can like type up the characters, the PCs and the NPCs. And so someone's PC will show up as another NPC in another game. So it's all this like shared living, breathing universe. That's a lot of fun. And, and I wanna emphasize that all of these projects and things are coming out of the community. It isn't anything that we're pushing from uh, our side of sort of the community management side but we're supporting that. Um, for example, when the pandemic started last year, um, there was a push among the community to how do we help people get into online gaming? And so we started a, a weekend convention called Gauntlet uh, uh, Open Gaming, or Gauntlet Community Open Gaming, which is basically a free online convention. We just had our last one of that uh, a week ago, it had uh, a little over three dozen sessions. It's free. Anybody can sign up. And we've helped people who haven't played online get used to playing online. Uh, and then we've uh, introduced people to new games through that. And the, this was our fourth time we've done that. Um, and th that's some work. But it's it's something that the community wanted to do, and so they generated the ideas and and they put it together, and, and we just implemented it, created another instance of our calendar uh, for that, and so that's been been really fruitful by uh, uh, as a tool for for bringing new people online. Some of them join the gauntlet, some of them go on to to play with their own groups. Uh, either way is fine. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, do do people have questions that they want to hit us up either on this or the work that we've done? Jamila's a veteran designer with excited <laughs> things that they they've done. Um, so if anybody has any questions in chat, uh, feel free to to ask, um, uh, or or we can just continue to. So I'm going to ask uh, using my voice maybe and even fire sure. up the camera. So yeah. Uh, so I love Gauntlets. It's, yeah, you guys were huge inspiration for AU. I mean, I'm part of the community too, basically, but not very active one. Uh, Gauntlet was huge inspiration for Conline. And my question is, what was hardest for the for the Gauntlet? I mean, what was the like biggest crisis or um, most problematic things? Because I I know about some hardships, but I would like to hear you talk about it. Because yeah, I I think I think that's a fair question. So. We had a change of management back in August 2019, which is when I, I took over. Um, and that's not necessarily what I want to talk about. But what I want to talk about, what came out of that is we created a group called the Gauntlet Care Commu Committee, which is a group of people who uh, uh, meet every couple of weeks and talk about things that are happening in the community, how we how we can deal with those issues. And it's also the people that when there are questions of, of players violating community standards, how, how do they uh, approach that? Uh, and uh, it's, it's something that before there was very much just kind of bans and, and uh, uh, you know, a quick reactions without looking at it, but uh, we established a process for uh, uh, dealing with those issues, and it's been tough. I, I, I'm not going to uh, sugarcoat it. Uh, sometimes you have player behavior uh, that over time becomes disruptive, uh, and then you have to stop and intervene, and you've got to talk to people. You've got to get statements. You've got to handle that uh, in a way that isn't done uh, is reviewed in private so that there's not a public kind of uh, uh, arguments about this and then and then take take steps and, and 
uh, we have had a couple of instances where we have uh, have removed players from the community. They are few and far between, uh, and it's tough. And we try to take we try to take a lot of time to review what's going on. But when when players uh, when players players cause safety issues to other players um, through harassment, uh, through uh, subtweeting, uh, through uh, a sort of violation of safety standards in play, those are times when you have to intervene and. And it can be tough because the social contract for gamers is, oh, we all just want to get along. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that that sometimes uh, doesn't work. I will say we have a procedure now where if uh, a GM is uncomfortable playing with a particular player, uh, they can come and talk to the committee and uh, uh, then... Uh, one of us will will speak to that particular player and, and say, this GM does not want to, to have you as a player. They're uncomfortable. Sometimes players don't sync up with GMs. Uh, uh, that happens from time to time. We've had to do that in the, the years that I've been managing things, I think less than five, uh, five or less times. Um, but we've got that process in play. You have to have that. Uh, you can't just say, well, you've got to get along. Uh, you, I mean, uh, and, and we have a template for how we approach those things. That, does that answer your question, Zephyr? Oh, yeah, this is a good one. So there's another question. I realized I should read it out loud for the recording. Oh. Uh, a follow-up question, how to avoid burnout of people who are moderating and managing the community, because this is something we often see in fan communities. And this is very true. When I first joined, this was a conversation that was going on, like how do we make sure that we don't have burnout? And uh, I remember when I was trying to volunteer to do a lot of things, Lowell told me, we want to make sure people don't burn out. So how about you just volunteer for one thing? But yeah, Lowell, what, what has the community been doing? So one thing is try to make sure that people aren't taking on multiple tasks. People will try to take on more things than, than they can reasonably do. So you have to be willing to say, no, uh, we need you to do this. Uh, that That's uh, one thing. Two, uh, having a larger group looking over things than you would expect. Um, our care committee is six people that's a lot of people. Um, it means that maybe we move a little bit slower because we, we're at we're various different time zones. Um, uh, we've got uh, uh, several Europeans and several people on the east and west coast of the United States in there. Um, but having that larger group means that any one person can step back to take a breather or not, not handle things. But I will say, I do think that is the biggest challenge for communities. Um, it's a tough job to do, uh, uh, to, to manage that. And, and that, that I, I, I don't have a great answer for it. Um, I'm just to be absolutely blunt. I think getting more people in, stopping and having conversations about, uh, about bringing new people in, uh, uh, constantly is all, uh, it's all really important. Uh, uh, I wish I had a better answer. <laughs> no, I will say, I feel, I, I think you should give yourself a little more credit, Lo, because when I joined the game facilitator camp, I felt that Tyler, who was handling that, who's also part of the care community, he really made sure that we weren't going to push ourselves too hard, that we would, uh, like, I remember I was going to offer at a weird time. And then Tyler was like, no, 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 but you're not going to get enough sleep if you do that. Like he was doing the time zone math <laughs> to check on me. So I feel like those, our community managers and the people of the care team have really placed consideration to really 
to really consider where people are coming from and to make sure we're not pushing ourselves too hard. And because we understand that the Codlet is a thriving community, but it's a thriving community of volunteers yeah. who really love what they do. So it's very easy to burn yourself out doing something you love. So I feel we are, we try very hard to be considerate of each other. I don't know as we have, uh, a, a, here's, so someone has asked a question about, uh, is the process uh, available somewhere in a written format? Uh, I will give a link to what we have as the procedures for people who uh, have issues, how we, we have a, a public sort of contact statement. Uh, and, uh, but I don't know as we have uh, a formal thing. The, I, I can say we do have a formal boilerplate template that we use when, when there are GM player friction issues. Um, uh, so I'll see about, about maybe getting uh, something, uh, uh, something out for that. Um, yeah, that's true. So we could share. Yeah. I also want to share that we have a code of conduct that the group worked on. So I want, I'll share it in, in the chat, but basically the URL is uh, you can find it at gauntlet-rpg.com, I think. Yeah. I think you can find it. Yeah. yeah. Among the community resources tab, there's the community code of conduct there. It, uh, so, mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's adapted from other sources. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it is uh, it is absolutely available for anyone to adapt to their own community. Um, anybody can take that and 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 remix it. It is, it is out there for everyone. Um, uh, yeah, I just wanted to throw in that we basically uh, you reused it for Conline. So what people read when they come to Conline is Polish version of this. And uh, it's like, it's hard to improve something. And I, I just realized um, we are, our time is running out, but I just realized that what I really would, would love to do, and I kind of regret we didn't do that that way, is do a panel with you or like someone else from Gauntlet and some people from Poland from commu various communities, because the trouble you are talking about are like uh, one of the uh, magician mentioned in the chat. We had this weekly initiative, uh, time for adventure. That, it was called it was like weekly rpg sessions be weekly sorry and it was going for years and there was a huge problem with burnout of people who mm. were managing it because even though it wasn't too much of an effort but the fact that was every second week you have to mail out things gather forms inform people because we were doing like a manual connecting of players to the mm -hmm. GMs semi-manual and it was like not much of the work but very regularly for a long time like becomes a burden it kind of like waits on you so like when you said that don't take too much take one task at the time it sounds like so very true <laughs> because I was saying similar things to someone a couple of months ago or like a year ago and automating the process, I will say we could not function in with it, the strength that we have if we did not have our dedicated calendar app because it, it emails people out so they know what, uh, uh, what they've signed up for. The GM knows who signed up for their game. And we make it a, a thing that we ask that GMs contact the players a week ahead of time. And that's all out of my hands. Uh, that that's on we we've we've moved that and and split that burden around um even like i'll give an example this the our community open gaming thing kind of runs itself uh i get gms together we have some people that moderate the discord because we always want to have moderation there uh but this like this last weekend i played and i didn't do anything else and uh i'm supposed to the person who's running it and and that getting automation and processes really helps. Um, yeah, that's uh, a good point. So uh, Jamila, do you want to say anything else before we wrap? Yeah, uh, I just want to say that, you know, the Gauntlet community is, is one that really focuses on play and what that really means in terms of play culture, in terms of creating a place of safety, in terms of, being a place where you can connect to others who love indie games, OSR games, story games, as much as everybody else. And we'd love to see you there. Uh, you can join in 
let us know if you want to join in any of our games. We're going to have another open gaming meet in a few months, I think, right? I, I think probably we're going to try and fall between Gen Con and Origins, maybe. Uh, so, Ooh, yeah. so later on in the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But And we also have, but you know, you can join our calendar games at any time. Uh, and Lo, where can they find us online? Like, I know uh, we have you find our... us at gauntlet-rpg.com is, is our primary site. Uh, Zephyr, is that that good? Are we? Does that feel like? Yes, a... that's wonderful. I'm I'm very happy to have you here, and I dropped those links on the general chat. When we finish with like wrapping everything up, I will I will uh, put the recording up and let you know where it is. And yeah, I just want to say it because Agalatea that uh, she left after she left uh, because she's a helper here. She wrote on the uh, on the general Polish channel. I don't believe this is existing about uh, <laughs> gauntlet with multiple hearts. So, oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> yeah, that's what I wanted you here. I mean, I wanted people to see like that this is possible. You can you can roll this way. So, thank you, thank Absolutely. you very much. Thanks so much Absolutely. for having us. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.